How's it going everyone? Eulir Gonzalez again, now standing up uh, and looking at the front-end design system which is a course taught by If Me Ray, uh, this software engineer that has previously worked at uh, JetBrains and then now at Meta. Uh, and the goal of this uh, course is to understand now the fundamentals if you're going to do, if you're going to be a UI specialist as a way to build more complex large web applications. So uh, today we're going to make a quick recap of what we have learned so far, especially with the introduction and the core fundamentals. Uh, and I want I don't, I won't go I won't uh, I won't go to dive deep into this uh, in, into the details, right? I just want us to uh, now take a look at the DOM API, understand the DOM API, how you can use that and as a way to now make a more practical uh, example, to put a practice uh, the DOM API, especially when querying elements and that kind of thing. And what are the best practice according to Evni Ray? And what is the recommendations and the use case to use now the DOM API uh, as a way to now build this UIS uh, element? or this large-scale complex UI. So, uh, because of that, right, um, this course, as I mentioned, is laid out uh, in this particular structure. So you got an introduction, the core fundamentals, DOM API, and all of this, right? Uh, where the entire reason of this is to see how all of this is organized, is to see how now, when you're going to build an application, how a lot of the time it makes much more sense to understand the anatomy of that, which is by looking at is the components of the of the application, the backend, the API, and the frontend. And because this course is for UI specialists, so we're gonna look at what are the different areas in UI uh, or the frontend development that are fundamentals especially now in today's world if you want for example is to now build is this complex large applications for example a chat application or for this particular ui here that you're looking right now uh, for google docs or uh, for uh, another uh, content base right uh, uis like youtube for example uh, or, for example, a uh, more text-based, like ChatGPT, for example. So the idea here is to, if you're going to dedicate to this, you're going to be uh, now a UI specialist, it's important to understand how you can do that. What are the basic building blocks that allow you to now, when it comes to provide your service or build this large complex UI applications, uh, what is the fundamental, what is the basic building blocks that allow you to do that? So that is the core fundamentals. So here, uh, uh, by looking at now how the uh, formatting context and the stacking context are related to each other, and how by defining it in the stacking context or creating a stacking context, uh, you can now uh, optimize that as a way to talk to the GPU and from there um, um, yeah, and how of these uh, contexts are connected to the GPU as a way to now improve is the rendering so the use of research the use the use of uh, of machine research especially for the GPU so you don't let the browser to actually use CPU, you instead you tell the browser to use now more CPU. And because uh, as a way to know how that works, we need to understand these composite layers that allows us to now uh, optimize, uh, that allows us to not only talk to the GPU, but also to optimize the use of that resource, right? So um, this is not the core fundamentals. Okay, and then how everything is connected with the DOM API, which is they build the tools that allow us to query data, 
okay? Uh, and how you can now build more complex patterns uh, as a way to now solve more complex user interface. Uh, the virtualization here is just an example of how you can do that. Uh, and then part of the anatomy of the front-end application, which uh, is made of not only of the uh, way of how we can communicate to our, to our application, which is the app, the API communications, which protocols are we going to use? Hey, HTTP or WebSocket or uh, TRCP or uh, remote procedure calls. Uh, perhaps we're going to go with uh, SOAP. Uh, but in any case, right, what will be one of the way of how we can communicate to that server? API communications, how you can now, once you get the data, manage and store your data in an effective and efficient way and then how you can now use the most common UI design patterns to come to solve some of the most common use cases for example showing a lot of elements in a or render a lot of elements in a particular uh, screen for example on e-commerce uh, and then how you going to manage your assets in the front end, right? CSS, JavaScript, and HTML, fonts, image, you name it. So um, I'm gonna make a quick recap here of the core, core fundamentals, right? Uh, and then what we really care about in today's video. So as I mentioned before, that the front end uh, is part of the anatomy of the applications where you have now the back end, the API, and the front end, right? So on the front end, uh, we have is, as I mentioned before, the uh, API communications, which is all of these areas that involve this component, this part of the anatomy of here, which is the um, API communications, the, the API communications, the UI data management, the UI uh, design pattern or the, the user interface uh, patterns all right or integrations or interactions uh, as well as the asset management so because of that as a way to understand all of this it's important to know the core fundamental which is if you're going to work with a browser you need to know how that actually treat the elements you use the HTML tags so in CSS everything has a box around that HTML tags so that's what we look at the box anatomy uh, also is what are the box property which is the sites which can be intrinsic and restricted as well as the box type which can be uh, inline and block and anonymous and how now the block and the inline where they have the particular rules, it participates in something called a formatting context, block and inline. So this formatting context, uh, the key feature of that is that it allows now the browsers to not only isolate this set of elements inside of this context, formatting context, uh, but also uh, it is a scalable because you can use not only a you can use whatever uh, formatting context you want to or any layout you want to uh, that it makes it scalable because by using it as a display uh, flex or grid or block or inline inline block uh, you can now uh, ha extend the formatting context of each one of them uh, as well as each one of them has their own set of rules which make them predictable so predictability uh, scalability and isolations are one of the three key areas of uh, or, or the sales pitch when to use or when to know when to use is this formatting context so we also look at an example of how the browser created that and how now that is connected to the 
way of how the browser positioning elements. So because it's follow now these things called the normal flow, where you put all of these elements um, uh, from right to left or left to right, depend on the orientation that you specify to the document. Uh, when you change the normal flow, you put now elements outside of the normal flow via position relative or absolute uh, or any other CSS transformation that now create or that put elements outside of the normal flow, aka it creates now in a stacking context. Uh, each one of those rules or each one of those property uh, or elements or pro yeah, properties like position relative, absolute, and uh, CSS transformations allow those allows to stack in context uh, to follow a particular rules, per absolute and per relative, as well as uh, the transformations, and also uh, by isolating this layer. Now the browsers can perform optimizations on each one of those layers because most of the time when you manipulate the elements or when you interact and when you change the geometry or the position of the elements, those require is CPU computations. So by using now some of the CSS classes like transform uh, or yeah, for example, like transform. Uh, you can tell the browser, hey, I don't want you to pass through the reflow process. And the reflow is one of the stage of the assembly line where the browser, uh, this is one of the stage at the assembly line of the browser when it comes to transform is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript into pixel on the screen. So this is when the browser receives the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. First, it parses the HTML into a DOM, document object model representation, as well as a CSS object model. Both of them, it translated into a tree data structure. Uh, and when they merge that, it notes all the information, all right? So this is the way how you can now represent data. Uh, so the machine can actually understand what it's about. Uh, by looking at this particular structure, tree-like data structures, uh, which contains all the information about now uh, the next phase, which is the reflow, which is how the browser is going now to put all of these elements on the screen and it is geometry, okay? There is a very interesting video actually uh, that show how now the gecko actually position all these elements and then calculate all of this uh, calculate the geometry uh, as well as the position of all of these elements and I think this is very interesting uh, because now this is something that is doing so blazing fat that you can barely that you can barely notice that that exists <laughs> okay pretty much like uh, when you watch a movie the illusion is there, but you ignore that a lot of the time, uh, which is 24, 30, 60 frames per second. Uh, and now in in games like uh, in, high, in high demand games for your CPU is using like 120 frames per second. That I is good. It's good. So um, the point of this. <laughs> right, is that the reflow is this particular process that actually is uh, trigger CPU uh, cal a calculation. So it talk to the CPU uh, in older browsers uh, and in more frequent browsers, uh, it's a combination between the GPU and the the CPU and the GPU. So the idea here is that when you interact or manipulate an element via C JavaScript, a DOM element via JavaScript, and then you alter your geometry over its position, a lot of the time you are re-triggering is that particular uh, pipeline, the reflow pipeline, which is made of, well, now we need to calculate is the layout, which the layout phase is actually CPU intense, uh, and then the paint and the composites. So the paint is 
now the phase of where it's going to put all of those elements on the bitmap on the screen okay uh, and the idea here is that by using some of this CSS class uh, that doesn't that trigger now an optimized pipeline which is talk directly to the uh, GPU all right uh, with this particular line like transforming that now how that happened is by something known as the composite layer the way how the browsers or the way how you can tell the browser to talk to the GPU is through the composite layers because initially you have now the render tree which each one of those elements has a representation in the render object okay when you now change uh, the <clears throat> uh, the position of these elements so when you create now an a stacking context okay uh, you are effectively creating now is a render layer so for example when you change the normal flow of that also uh, when you use is the uh, canvas and videos uh, and because now uh, by doing this uh, sometimes you want to now or, or sometimes the browser or if you wants to now uh, talk to the browser you use is this particularly transformations or perspective transform 3d and perspective transform this is the way how you can talk from the css directly to the hardware hey i want you to know it's create is this graphic layer right and all of this which is following is a particular example it's just a way of how by knowing the particular pipeline or the core fundamentals of this when it comes to actually interact or build this ui elements first we need to know as what is the dom api which is well the way how now you can represent a document platform and language agnostic all right so pi is scripting language like python can have access to that you can also can have access from javascript and this is why uh, a lot of the time frameworks uh hide this uh, because now they provide you know an encapsulation layer where you can actually is omit this all right but sometimes you want us to know build lower level things here. Uh, for example, is like visualizations, or perhaps you want to build is a, or when you want to do some DOM management, okay? Perhaps you want us to uh, write a a component, uh, for example, for a charge engine or for video player, or you just simply want to build a portfolio with a minimal. Uh, app blueprint right <clears throat> uh, especially for companies <clears throat> okay so what you need to cover this particular use case for companies based on their needs that's what you need to know about is the dom and now uh that the dom is something that any language can have access i also look at example from python which to me that was mind-blowing uh, but because JavaScript was built to provide interactivity to the browser and the browser is this mechanism or this engine that allows us to render is HTML, CSS and JavaScript uh, and transforming to pixel on the screen the way how can we interact uh, to the HTML is through the DOM which is something that is generated by the browser okay <clears throat> And now it exposes certain global objects. I'm not a big fan. Of, I'm not a big fan of global objects uh, because explicitly is much more meaningful. So being explicit is much more meaningful. You can describe the intent much more. Uh, but again, this is more a philosophical aspect, personal opinion. All right. So the global object that you can have access from JavaScript provided uh, from the DOM is that, well, you have now the window, you have now is 
uh, yeah, the window object, which to represent is the viewport, as well as the document. Okay, you can access through the document or the window the document, as well as the head and the body. Okay, and how now uh, by understanding what is the hierarchy of the DOM, or in other words, how the DOM is made of. All right. Uh, because so far what we look is the global object what are the objects that we can have access not only to the DOM uh, but related to uh, to the DOM okay and also we need to look at how now the DOM is organized in class hierarchy uh, and the TLD is that it is made of the HTML element which it extends from this more general class called the elements that actually contain is the DOM API and that, that to me is quite interesting okay and that element uh, because with elements you can represent is for example any so HTML or any XML uh, object or XML language uh, so for example like SVG is one of them math ML, ML, barely use that. That's very narrow specific to scientific community or scientific projects. Okay, math ML. Uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, so these elements, right, now extend from the node. And that to me is quite interesting. That to me is quite interesting. From the node, right? Node uh, element in from the DOM API, right? Node. Um, except the DOM node, because this is part of the DOM API. The DOM node interface is an extra class based upon which many other DOM objects uh, are based. So this is the root of this. The node is uh, the root elements or the base class that other elements are based on. Okay. Uh, thus, letting those objects type to be used similarly and often interchangeably. And after class, uh, there is no such thing as a plain node object. Yeah, as an after class, there is no such thing as plain node objects. Exactly, because this abstract class is something that can be derived to other things. All objects that implement no functionality are based on one of its subclasses. Most notably, mm -hmm, all objects that implement no functionality that extend from that are based on one of its subclasses. Most notably are document, element, and document fragment. Mm -hmm. We barely know about this. I am quite familiar to the document fragment. Yeah, I am quite familiar to the document fragment. Represent a minimal document object that has no pattern. It is used as a lightweight version of document that store a segment of a document structure comprised of no, just like a standard document. The key difference is the fact that the document fragment isn't part of the active document tree structure. Changes made to the fragment don't affect the document. Mm -hmm. Which means is that you can is you can build on the fly this uh, document fragment uh, and insert that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and insert that or remove it and append that makes a lot of things slowly to have sense here so in addition every kind of node of dumb node is represented by an interface based on the node this include at character data which text comment c data sections and processing instructions are all based on and document type mm. Mm -hmm. In some cases, a particular feature of the base node interface may not apply to one of its child interface. 
In that case, the inheriting no may return no or throw an exception. Depending on the circumstance, for example, attempting to add children to a no type that cannot have children will throw an exception. Mm -hmm. Remember that after all, because the DOM is represented as a tree, that's why it's important to look at this data structure and algorithm, okay? Because the dung is represented as a tree, okay? Um, mm -hmm. The dung is a document model uh, loaded in the browser. And the dung is a document model loaded. Okay. The DOM is a, mock, it's a document model loaded in the browser and representing the document as a node tree or DOM tree, right? Where each node represents part of the document, element, text string, or comment. Mm -hmm. The DOM is one of the most used API on the web because it allows code running in a browser to access and interact with every node of the document. Nodes can be created, move or change, move or change. Event listener can be added to node and triggered to occurrence of a given event. So um, that's why it's important, <laughs> and I'm going to do that uh, later. Uh, of the this is the lead code, uh, need code. Right. Mm -hmm. It's part of the need code here. Uh, as a way to. Yeah, that's why I need to speed up things here completely. Right. As a way to know, look at three exercises here balance binary three, diametry of binary three, maximum depth of binary three, because this is representation. Lowest common ancestor of a binary search tree. Binary tree lever, order traversal. Binary tree, right side view. Count good nodes in binary tree. Validate binary search tree. And I, mm. and I get it why a lot of this computer science is going to move to graph because this topologist can now represent data and data is the oil of the 21 century mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. I think I think looking at the graph is something that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is interesting because this that a structure is a way of how you can rep. I get it. This that a structure is a way how computers can see what you are telling to them or in other words is that how computers can understand uh, the reality reality like uh, counting like searching sorting um, and see the relationship of data no it is it's quite abstract <laughs> it is quite abstract um, but in any case, I want to make it much more heavy than it could be. Uh, and it's important to actually take a look at this, which is something that I'm definitely going to do that. Definitely going to do that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, but yeah, this is DOM tree data structure, right? So that's what is a node. So a node is an abstract class, which uh, extends. Okay. Yeah, so a node is an abstract class, and when you talk about an abstract class, it's an abstract base class. When you see that, what it means is 
Um, exactly. Abstract class in Python. Uh, an abstract class can be considered as a blueprint for other class, preferring other classes. It allows you to create a set of methods that must be created within any child built from the abstract class. Okay, an abstract base class. So it's this blueprint for other classes. Uh, so for example, an abstract base class is, let's say you want to build a bicycle. Okay, you need at least is some basic stuff for that. You need the you need the steering wheel, you need the frame, you need at least um, a, you need you need at least the steering wheel, you need the frame, and a seat, right? Uh, and then you can add whatever you want to, right? It can be fat bike, it can be uh, yeah, it can be fat by, it can be any one of them, right? Um, yeah. So that's what I, what that's what a ba an abstract base class means, right? So it serves as a blueprint for other classes. So in this case, uh, the blueprint that it serves uh, are for document element and document fragment so this actually this node okay provide uh, provide three like properties so now this acts as a blueprint for element where you can have different type of uh documents all right it can be svg or it can be html which is an html document an html element and then you have now something weird here with HTML document that it can be is uh, extend from the node, but also it has access uh, to the DOM API. Uh, from the node, you have now the text node, all right, and now the uh, that the HTML document contain is a window. This particular class hierarchy can be quite confusing at the beginning, uh, but the idea here is that. There is no need to memorize this. It's to understand now how the DOM represents uh, the data. It starts with the DOM, with the node, and then uh, other which act as the base abstract class, aka the blueprint from other uh, classes, such as element. And inside of element, uh, you can this actually has now the DOM API. This particular elements can be any HTML or XML uh, based language. That's why you, for example, have now the HTML element that extend for that. Uh, also, I will argue that you should have this SVG HTML uh, element. Right. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Interesting. Oh, but not the tag SVG. Exactly. It's an XML markup language.
Well, then I guess. Uh, yes, that's right. So yeah, okay. But this is the class hierarchy, right? That's the class hierarchy. Um, yeah. And then we need to look at the uh, the DOM query, right? So how can you actually now just DOM 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 query? Dumb query. Take the dumb query. That's right. Global objects. It's like global object. Except the global objects. And then you have the class hierarchy. So class hierarchy mm -hmm. and then you got now the DOM query right so what are the methods that we can use right and what is the trade-off of using each one of those methods and what are the elements that they return for them Okay. Uh, on a page, how it can reference. So, the object by its uh, by the class name, we need to act the situation complexity and read cost is just O1 um, because the, this is just basically accessing the object by its key. Mm -hmm. The situation is slightly different when it comes to get elements by class name. Um, so to get the elements by the, uh, by the class name, we need to actually traverse the whole tree. And the way the browser traverses the tree, it's used the DFS approach. So it basically goes through the elements and finds all the, uh, all the elements on a page with the class the text. First. So, and so the time complexity for this is uh, linear. So we need to go through all elements in the worst case but you see there is a star here. This is because the mm -hmm. browser is quite smart and it utilizes the hash map when you try to query things. So the first query... Doug, uh, let me get element by class name. Get element by class name. Warning, this is a live HTML collection. Changing the DOM will reflect in the array as the change occur. If an element selected by this array no longer qualify for the selector, it will automatically be removed. Be aware of this for iteration purpose. Mm -hmm. Because it maintains something called this is a live HTML collection. A generic collection a generic collections array like objects similar to arguments. This interface is called HTML collection for historical reasons because before the the modern DOM collecting or collections implementing this interface will only have HTML elements and to, uh, as their items. This interface was an attempt to create a modified list and only continues to be supported to no break code that are already using it. Modern API represents list structure using type base on JavaScript array, thus making many array methods available and at the same time imposing additional semantic of this usage, so just making their items read only. Mm, this historical reason does not mean that you as a developer should avoid HTML collection. You should don't create HTML collections objects yourself, but don't get but you get them from APIs such as document get element by class name. And these APIs are not deprecated. 
However, be careful of semantic difference from a real array. The existence of this dumb stream list is a historical accident. Today, modern API is the same use case are met by using array instance. We need something array list like. Okay. Part of the method from the DOM is a way to have access to this element here, to the null element. This is a live HTML collection. HTML collection. collection mm 
life collection. Exactly, it's modified that. Okay. It's dynamic, it's like, mm, it's life. Life updating. So any change we do to these elements... Mm -hmm. Will take some time, but when if you execute the same query next time, the browser, it will, it will be almost immediately because the browser utilizes the caching mechanism. And one thing about uh, this method is also it returns the HTML collection. And the HTML collection is the special, actually, legacy collection, uh, which uh, has one interesting characteristic, it's life. So this means that if we modify the DOM tree and, for instance, remove one element from, uh, from the DOM, this will be reflected on our HTML collection. So, and th uh, that's why the read cost of the HTML collection is uh, big, o, big O of N, because every time we need a s to read a single element, the browser will parse the tree again to verify its position. So the, uh, this is a disadvantage of this thing. But uh, on, on the other hand, the memory cost is low because the browser doesn't need to clone any objects. It just takes the uh, already existing references so you can utilize the HTML collection when you uh, when you need to be low, like when you're low on memory, you need, you need to use as less memory as possible. Okay, same uh, is uh, the same way works. They get element by tag name, so there is no difference at all. It's just like it allows us to query things by the tag. So the query selector works slightly different. Uh, so it utilizes the CSS selector. So the time complexity depends on the selector that we use. So we always pay some um, tax on uh, compiling the selector. So this means that the, the more complex selector you have, the more time it takes to compile it for CSS. And so the read access and the, uh, the memory cost is big of one because we're just returning the single uh, the single element. And the query mechanism, when we try to use the class names or the text, it's the same as the DFS. If we use the ID, then we're going to convert the statement to get element by ID instead. So one interesting thing about the query selector, uh, and this is the query selector all, is because it returns the node list. The node list is a another type of collection, but it's not life. It's just basically the copy of the elements. So what the browser does is just copies uh, the HTML objects. And this means that we pay additional memory costs when we uh, do the querying. So it's not advisable to query too many things because you may end up having the memory spike. Uh, but the read access is all one because you're just accessing the object directly from the array instead of traversing the tree again uh, by maintaining the life collection. And the querying mechanism is the same, DFS plus HMAP. Rain to query, it meant to get element by ID instead. 
So one interesting thing about the query selector, uh, and this is the query selector all, is because it returns a node list. The node list is a, another type of collection, but it's not live. It's just basically the copy of the elements. So what the browser does is just copies uh, the HTML objects, and this means that we pay additional memory cost when we uh, do the querying. So it's not advisable to query too many things because you may end up having the memory spike. Uh, but the read access is all one because you're just accessing the object there. But what this is the query selector all is because it returns a node list. The node list is a, another type of collection, but it's not live. It's just basically the copy of the elements. So what the browser does is just copies uh, the HTML objects. And this means that we pay additional memory cost when we uh, do the querying. So it's not advisable to query too many things because you may end up having the memory spike. Uh, but the read access is all one because you're just accessing the object directly from the array instead of traversing the tree again uh, by maintaining the live collection. And the query mechanism is the same, DFS plus HashMap. Quick summary. So the get elements by ID provide the best performance um, but uh, because the browser builds the, builds the cache, but you need to make sure that you utilize the ID space correctly. So it's basically anti-pattern to you to rely on IDs too much because the ID uh, namespace is shared across your multiple components and uh, just make sure that you don't overuse IDs in your app. Uh, the get elements by class name or get elements by tag name provide a low memory overhead because it returns the live collection with uh, just the uh, uh, references to existing objects. But because it uh, the read access is high, so you need to make uh, you need to make sure that you to utilize you utilize this collection right. Because if you're going to loop for this collection, guess it will convert to quadratic time. So and we don't want and we don't want to do that in your in our app on the large set of elements. The query name provides a low memory overhead because it returns the live collection with uh, just the uh, uh, references to existing objects. But because it, uh, the read access is high, so you need to make uh, you need to make sure that you utilize you utilize this collection right. Because if you're going to loop for this collection, guess it will convert to quadratic time. So and we don't want and we don't want to do that in your in our app on the large set of elements. The query selector uh, have slightly worse performance than get element by ID, but the, the browser itself heavily optimize any CSS sele uh, selectors. So in different browsers, you may get different results, but on average, it's very close actually to get element by ID. Um, but the elements uh, that are returned from this query do not represent the live collection. So if you remove the element from the DOM tree, you may end up having the stale element in your in your collection. Yeah, the same applies to the query, uh, query selector all, but uh, it also, because it copies all the elements, you don't want to query uh, too many elements with this method. Could you clarify the difference between the time complexity of querying versus the read cost? Yeah, okay. So if we'll go back to uh, get elements by tag name, for instance. So the time complexity it takes to go through the elements, uh, to find all the elements that we are looking for, is big of n because we need to query, uh, we need to go through all elements in the worst case. But the read cost is also big o of n because uh, we maintain the live collection. And when we maintain, maintain a live collection, this means that the browser needs to verify that the element exists in the DOM tree. So every time you're trying to access this live collection, the browser queries the elements again to verify that the element is still present. That's why. Uh, or it can result to a time complexity being, in the worst case, we'll need to parse all elements again. Um, is there a reason the query selector all returns the non-live uh, element list compared to you know this one, for example, comparing or returning the live? Um, so the the live collection is actually a legacy one. Uh, it's not recommended to use for uh, normal cases, um, and I guess the query selector returns non-live collection. Uh, because we need, we needed to have some alternative. The live collection has more drawbacks, and if not used wisely, can lead to more issues. But in our uh, application development, we don't really need to manage the live collections. And for most of the developers, the query, query selector is the better go because uh, it doesn't have the uh, the redux, the expensive read access. Why would a query selector all impact memory? We're returning references to nodes, which already exist in the DOM. 
Uh, not exactly. We actually return uh, the copies of, uh, basically the browser creates a new object with the same values and the copies. And when you change the properties of this uh, object, um, it will impact the original object, but uh, it's still, we have two separate objects basically with the same properties and they are connected with each other for the proxy mechanism. So it's a slightly different. When we use the live collection, we actually guarantee uh, we can actually reuse the real reference to the object instead. When you're saying that the cache would make things faster next time, are you always sure about that because class names can be dynamic? Uh, so you can't control that because it's up to the browser engine. Like It's up to develop. It, the same query methods can behave differently in Safari or Chrome depending on how developers optimize that. For instance, uh, Safari browser uses the WebAssembly compilation for the native selectors, while the Chrome doesn't use that because they, perform, uh, they find that the performance of existing query selectors is fine uh, on average. So you can guarantee the same results, and it's up to the engine. So it, the logic of caching the element, the, class, uh, the query selector is quite complex, uh, and yeah, no guarantee. <laughs> Let's move on to performance best practices. So you hold now a live collection. Okay. And the other is get element or query selector. Exactly. Query selector. The matching is done using the first pre-order traversal of the document. Note, starting with the first elements in the f in the document's markup, and iterate through the sequential knowing order to the number of tail. If the specified selector match an ID that's incorrect, used more than once in the document, the first element with that ID is returned. Exactly. An element object representing the first element in a document that matches this specified set of CSS selector or null is returned if there is no match for it. If you, re if you need a list of elements matching the specified selector, you should use Query selectors. Query selector all. Returning a static, non live, node list representing a list of document elements that match the specified group of selector. It means that it's a copy of that. A non live, node list uh, containing one element object for each element that match at least one of the specified selector of an empty node list in case of no match. The elements are in the document. The elements are in document order. That is, parent before children, early siblings before later siblings. Accessing the matches.
Um, the first and the most obvious one, and all like over, the one overlooked uh, the most is that we can actually improve the performance of querying by simplifying the selector. So each time you use the complex selector, the CSS compiler needs to transpile this uh, and it takes more time. So you pay extra tax on using the complex selectors. So in, you, may, uh, you may notice that it's not significant. So you may pay like five milliseconds on the query to compile the, uh, the selector, but uh, all, all these things are accumulating. So if you do hundreds of queries, so it will result uh, maybe to 50 milliseconds uh, on average in the delay. So, but if we combine every, all possible optimizations with this one, the results can be quite significant. Although the IDs is not the best practice, you still can utilize IDs for the core container when, um, for instance, you need to query the element from the very large tree. So if we have the some DOM tree that has 10,000 elements, if you query from HTML, then you need to go through 10,000 10, elements on the first query. But if you, for instance, could select the sec this section with an ID, and then you know that this operation should be repeated multiple times, then you can just provide an end query from this section, and it will be just one operation. So next section is adding removing elements. And before we jump to that, any questions so far? So you talked about these, um, like understanding the differences between these methods being useful if you were going to build something mm -hmm. more low level. If you are working on something that is using a framework like React or Angular, yeah. are there recommendations you would make for improving performance or like knowing what their methods are using under the hood? Or do you just kind of trust that the library authors have spent a lot of time thinking about it? Yeah, when you utilize any library that manage, manages the DOM for you, you just rely on this library. Uh, the only way you can possibly think, you may use your uh, the DOM API within the some effects in the React when you need to query things. This is the place where you could optimize potentially. But uh, trying to optimize a React is not a good idea because it's quite complex inside. Is the cost of CSS only during compile time? Wouldn't the runtime of complex selectors also be uh, performance? No, actually, you compile this CSS only during actually, but uh, trying to optimize is a React is not what? a good idea because what? it's quite complex inside. Is the cost of CSS only during compile time? Wouldn't the runtime of complex selectors also be uh, performance? No, actually, you compile this first. You compile your styles in CSS. This compiled when you initiate the page, but. When you execute the JavaScript with some query selector, this is dynamic selector. This means it should be compiled in runtime. So you pay the cost every time you execute that. Okay, so let's now understand how we can add or remove elements. And when we, when it comes to adding or removing, every method is bad. So basically, <laughs> we don't have a good... Uh, so the performance impact is always significant. So there's no uh, good method to insert data because every time we modify uh, the DOM, it triggers the reflow. So uh, in, our, in our application, we want to minimize the reflow operation. And so, but there are a few methods that are particularly impact the performance. The first one is inner HTML. So when you use the inner HTML, you basically set, you basically set the HTML, the element, uh, the browser needs to involve the HTML parser to compile your HTML again, to uh, do a full reflow, validate your HTML and so on. So you pay the cost of the parsing. Same applies to insert a JSON HTML. Uh, because we use the raw HTML, the browser still needs to uh, to parse that. But mm -hmm. if if you need to modify the DOM, make sure that you don't utilize the inner HTML too often. It's okay to use this once per, per initialization. But uh, if you expect it to insert elements dynamically, then it's better to utilize the insert adjacent element or append child because it takes the um, compiled HTML object already uh, and just renders this on a DOM. And we can see how it works. Uh, so the method is pretty flexible because it accepts the position where we can insert the element. Uh, the first one is before begin, which basically insert the element before the target element. So we can try to insert that and the element is inserted. So the after begin will give you the first uh, child position, while the uh, before end will render element as a last child. 
and after end will give you the position right after the target element. So you, this method is very flexible and most can be used. Mm -hmm. uh, almost anywhere. And then how do we remove elements? So. Re uh, This, this is before end uh, will render element as a last child. And after end will give you the position right after the target element. So you, this method is very flexible and most can be used uh, almost anywhere. And then how do we remove elements? So re uh, removing elements can be done through the remove method. Basically, we need to have a reference to the, uh, to the object. And we can also reset the whole HTML by setting the empty string. We are going to um, do some live coding, a uh, very simple exercise. So we have some HTML template that we need to utilize, and we have our uh, create card component function. S so we need to implement the function that takes the title and the body, this is the string variables, and sets it to uh, the h3 tag and card body content. Uh, there are multiple ways how can you implement this, but uh, let's see what we can do here. And here we call this function, so this function should return HTML element, and then we append this element to the container. So to start with exercise, uh, check out the repository. I hope you will have the link to your repository in the chat, or you can also click on the uh, on the slides and open the folder. Uh, the function string presented well, any well, render tree, so presentation, but so we can do talk and the code. And I'll set uh, the card title and the card body mm. method, a clone and use HTML direct, uh, with the string directly. And representing the HTML as a string is not the best way to do things. So we want to have some kind of reusable way. How can we represent the templates? So, and apparently the in HTML, we have the special tag called template. So we can remove this line. And in the head, I'm going to use the template tag. So what this exactly. template does, it basically stores hold, your it's, HTML. It's exactly. You're telling to the browser, hey, please store this HTML reference in memory. Do not append it to the DOM. All right. So we can do something with it. In the lightweight uh, object in memory. Mm -hmm. So actually this content. Them, is not queryable oh by any uh, DOM API, so, so of any external scripts that, will not be able to uh, access now this content. Says, hey, so it's also it, not rendered on this. the final render tree, so uh, if your user if try, you give me tries to traverse the DOM tree, that, um, okay. uh, they will not be able to see that Which is uh, the this template is utilized. Itself. So it's kind of a lightweight representation then of our uh, card. So we edit the card template into the template tag, and we're also assigned the ID. So the content of the template is not queryable, but the template is. So we need to clone the content of the template. So let's update. Uh, let's first query the template. Exactly. And once we get some so we data from that. document, get element by ID. And then we use our car, car template. You can populate that with the so we need data. To but first is the element, uh, the card title, and the card body content. So let's query that. So let's call it card title and card So we are doing body. all of this is because and then we, we use the document. We want to avoid parsing. Okay. Therefore, and then we're providing two uh, selectors. Right. The first one is the card title. You provide now that then we need in to particularly pass the in a way that it understand that card uh, body content class. So now we selected two. Uh, two elements, card title and the card body, and now we want to update the text content of this elements. So we use the text content property and then assign, assign title. Then we need to use card body mm. and then assign. Text, so what we're doing here is to actually modifying to is that body variable. Okay, now we return the, the card, and if we run this example, so instead of actually uh, so now we're creating this. a new card you element, and, uh, the and then we're returning this card element okay. through, uh, from the uh, create card component function, assign some random text, and if we run the browser, 
we see that this doesn't work and let's see why. <laughs> and apparently we're trying to set the text content uh, so the property undefined. So probably we have a mistake in how we query things. Yeah, so we need to, we don't need to query the document. We need to query card. Where is the card? So and if we fix that, yeah, now we have our card rendered and all elements set. And this is it for the first exercise. Okay, let's have the quick look of how could could we potentially solve that. Uh, the first solution would involve had treating the article at, as a string. So we could create the placeholders within the context and just replace it with the uh, replace function, but this means we would need to work with a string. Um, and then we could append the content using the inner HTML, but this is not the, the best way because uh, we will, uh, will have to parse the content uh, here in inner HTML. And if we want to repeat this operation, uh, then it's Either HTML, MDN, right? <clears throat> uh, wait a second, in English, please. Get or set HTML or XML markup containing within the element. More precisely, in order HTML, get a serialization of nested child DOM within the element or set HTML or XML that should be parsed to replace the DOM tree within the elements, which means that you should parse to replace the DOM tree of that. To insert the HTML into the document, rather than replace the content of an element, use the method insert adjacent element. The serialization of the DOM tree read from the property does not include shallow roots. If you want to get an HTML string that includes shadow roots, you must use the get, H, uh, get HTML. For example, template is part into HTML template elements, whether or not shadow root mode uh, attribute is specified in order to the elements here. But to insert the HTML into the document rather than replace the content of an element, use insert adjacent HTML. Method of elements interface parse the specified. Uh, the method elements interface parse the specified text as HTML or XML uh, and insert the resulting nodes. Uh, oh, it's because it's the parsing. So anytime you you oh, okay. Anytime you hear about parsing, is something that is the computer needs to compute, therefore takes time. And you want it to make those things to happen fast as possible. I don't want to wait for this. And I want to make it, and I want you to make it the most, and I want to make it quick. Even though that I have to write a little bit more of code, uh, but the idea here is to give me the outcomes that I want Blazing fast. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So a string containing the HTML serialization of elements descendant. Setting the value of inner HTML, remove all of the elements descending, and replace them with no construct by parsing HTML by parsing the HTML given in this string html in the string ht in the string html string when set to null value the null value is converted to an empty string so the inner html null is equivalent to empty this Uses notes reading the HTML content of an element, replacing the content of an element, setting the value of inner HTML lets you easily replace the existing content of an element with a new context. This is a security risk. If the string to be inserted might contain potentially malicious code when inserting user supplied data, you should always consider using a sanitizer library in order to sanitize the content before it's inserted. Mm. 
Mm. <laughs> because never trust on user input. For example, you can er erase the entire content of a document by cleaning the content of the document's body attribute, text content. This example fetch the document current HTML markup and replace this particular character with the character this, thereby essentially converting the HTML into raw text. This is then wrapped in a pre-element, then the value of inner HTML is changed to, uh, to this new string. As a result, the document contain contents a replaced with the display and page entire source code. Operational details. What happened exactly when you set the value of inner HTML? Doing so caused the user agent to follow this step. The specified value is par as HTML or XML based on the document type, resulting in a document fragment, object representing the new set of DOM for the elements, but is parsing that. If the element whose contents are being replaced is a template element, then the template element contents attribute is to replace with the new document fragment, creating in step one. For all elements, the element contents are replaced with nodes in the new document frame. But it's exactly, but it says the specified value is part as an HTML or XML. If the element whose contents are being replaced is a template element, then the template element's content attribute is replaced with the new document fragment creating in the step one. So it doesn't parse that? But no, but it follow this step. Mm, it's because it's parsing that. It is not uncommon to see inner HTML used to insert text into web pages. There is a potential for this to become an attack vector on the site, creating a potential security risk. Of course, because you're letting the user to actually insert any here. Mm -hmm. Also, this may look like a cross-site scripting attack. The result is harmless. HTML specified that script tag inserted with inner HTML should not execute at ah, these specifications. However, there are ways to execute JavaScript without using a script element, so there's still a security risk whenever you use that. Holy moly. <laughs> it's because you are parsing that. And when you're parsing, it means you are computed. It means you're going to evaluate this. Ah, that, that's, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Warning, if your project is one of that uh, will undergo any form of security review, using inner HTML most likely will result in your code being rejected. For example, if you use inner HTML in a browser extension and submit the extension to add or not, it may be rejecting review process. Okay. Oh my god. Oh my god. This is. Oh, nigga. <laughs> That's quite interesting. Oh my god. That's very, very interesting. As a way to know how you can query, add and remove element, and how you can have is the inner HTML. But the problem with it is it parsed that. And if it parsed, it's going to execute whatever you're passing that, an HTML or an XML, which means that you want to have, you want to skip this parse thing, or the, is this this parse step here? And as a way to avoid that, all right, um, you use now a document fragment for thousand, the, which is a very natural. Before we jump. Mm -hmm. So this is a way to actually how you can now add elements here and there. Mm -hmm. In a in the most performant way. Mm -hmm.
move to the next session. Uh, do we have any question? Can you just explain again briefly why doing it that way doesn't trigger reflow? Yeah. Um, of course. Because you're not parsing the HTML. So, when you modify the fragment, uh, it's not within the DOM tree. It's actually just in memory. So when you update any properties, so it doesn't trigger any reflow. So if you could potentially have the element in the DOM tree, and you would need to, and you you start updating the elements of the uh, the properties of this element, then this would cause reflow because the element already in the DOM tree. But since it's in memory, yeah, we can do uh, any operations and. Uh, it's it's disconnected from the main DOM tree. The only thing that counts the reflow is when we use append channel. Even when you append that. So the DOM API is actually pretty... Not when you are modifying that. And appending a child, not when you're modifying that. And appending a child... Very thing. simple. It's, it has some uh, limited set of methods that we can utilize. And uh, it's very useful if we're trying uh, to build some low-level things, but we need to think about the caveats that the uh, DOM API uh, has. So for instance, make sure that you utilize the HTML live collection wisely, so uh, don't query. This is fundamental, especially because you, if you're going to provide some integrations to other... Oh my god. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you're going to provide integration to other, com uh, to other applications, okay, if you're going to provide Oh shit! If you're going to pro, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're going to provide integration with third-party services, companies demands that, all right. And by now adding third-party script to this, you can actually do that. Too many elements, mm -hmm. and then uh, don't try to read the uh, HTML live collection because it will result to quadratic time. Um, for most of the cases, the query selector is, uh, has a good performance and you can just utilize it uh, almost everywhere. So for rare cases, when you really need to have the live collection, make sure that you work with a small subset of data to reduce any performance impact. So then... Oh my god. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. Okay, that'll be all for this video. Take care. Bye-bye.